Hey, folks. Welcome back to Sorry What. I'm Jason, and today's story is another long one, so grab your favorite drink, find a chill spot, and let's dive right in. I was sitting on the deck sipping my morning coffee thinking over the conversation I overheard at the barbecue we hosted last evening. I'm thinking over the conversation because the two women I trust in my life were plotting to betray me. They had both gotten drunk, even though I asked that no alcohol be served. I am John Carmody, I am 33 now, almost 6 tall, slightly underweight at 145 pounds. I am a very successful author of young adult stories, and bodice rippers romance and some other kinds of novels. I use different pseudonyms for different genres of stories. My names besides my own are Gary Crowswell for my young adult stories, Elizabeth Jester for my contemporary romance novels, and Becca Ballantine for my old west romances. I met CC, Carolina Catherine, Dolman when I was 27. We met in an unorthodox way. I was returning on a Friday from a New York City meeting with my publishers. I was out at the cab stand at my home airport hailing a cab when I was run over by a woman who could not see around the mound of luggage on her luggage cart. I wasn't hurt, just pissed. I turned to give the miscreant a big and angry piece of my mind when I saw a vision. Unfortunately, she was crying. I'm sorry, are you hurt? She asked. Before I could answer, I heard her mutter under her breath, Great, I get dumped by my fiancé, fired from my job, miss my early flight, then get bumped from the next, and now I run over some poor dumb asshole that had nothing to do with my shitty week. Look, miss, I did not move into your way, I was not even in the path to the parking garage, you have no reason to call me an asshole. The cab I called arrived and I got in and told him where I was headed. I went home and got a beer from the fridge and just started to decompress when the house phone rang. I recognized the number as my business cell phone. I answered sharply, hello, this is the Carmody residence. What are you doing with my phone? I heard a definite giggle and a female voice respond, I'm the dumb witch that called you an asshole, and when I restacked my luggage your phone was on the ground. I'm calling to find out how I can get it back to you. I am in Southside. I will bring the phone to you if you give me your address. If you will let me, I will bring dinner. Do you like Chinese? It will be my way to partially apologize. Everyone that is human and doesn't have some kind of food allergy likes Chinese. I live at 4657 Crestwood CT. In West End. Do you know how to get here? I heard a sparkling laugh, GPS, you man, you. I also have a friend that lives down the street from you in the subdivision, so I'll find it. Let's figure on 630. Okay. Yup. That's fine, I like what is generally called house fried rice or five meat fried rice, and egg rolls. I also will try anything but isn't the man supposed to provide on a date. I don't want to get too adventurous on our first date. Wait, this is going to be our first date isn't it? We'll see. The giggle and then all I heard was silence, I never did get her name. As I have a housekeeper and had not been home for 4 days, there wasn't much to do to make the house presentable. I put my dirty clothes in the hamper and got my meeting suit ready to take to the cleaners. By the time I was finished, my accumulated jet lag caught up with me. I took a nap after setting my alarm for 5.30. When the alarm chimed, I was in better shape, and after a long shower, I was near as human as an author can be. We writers are somewhat strange ducks. Right at 6.30, the side doorbell rang. The vision was standing there with a large bag with the logo of my favorite Chinese restaurant on it. I took the bag, moved to the side and said, Enter fair maiden, my castle is indeed fortunate that you grace it with your presence. That earned me a giggle and an introduction. First let me introduce myself. I am Carolina Dolman of the Southside Dolmans. We are a vigorous and aggressive breed, but I come bearing peace offerings. Sir Knight, we bear you no ill will, and punishment has been visited on the person who caused you misfortune. I accept your offerings of peace, but I must visit my own punishments on the dastardly cat that caused the upset to my person. Perhaps maybe a thrashing with the open hand delivered to that sorry individual's posterior. What say you? No Sir Knight, anything but that, my flesh is too delicate to stand the abuse. Then we both broke up laughing. Carolina, I am John Carmody, I am 27, and other than a housekeeper, unattached, so you need to watch yourself now that you are in my evil clutches. I thank you for delivering my phone, and I am not angry about the airport. I was a little when I heard your muttering, but after I thought about it, I realized that everyone can have a day like your mutterings described. I do not require any more apology than you coming here. This house has not had anyone as beautiful as you since my mother and sister were here. You are very easy on the eyes. With that, we dug in. After dinner, I showed CC, she asked me to call her that, the house and grounds. As I said, I am a very successful author, and own the equivalent of four lots in the square. 
I explained to her what I did, but not my pseudonym, and said, because I was successful and did not want to rent I bought this place and the other lots. I got here when the developer first opened the place up. I was the first buyer, and so the lots I purchased are at the end of a cul-de-sac. The house is custom built and is a 4 bedroom 3 half bath ranch style 4000 SQ. Feet home. The master bedroom has an attached reading room office. The other 3 bedrooms are on the other side of the house and share 2 baths. CC was surprised when I showed her the backyard. The large patio had an outdoor kitchen, and the entire yard had a 7 foot privacy fence. CC told me she was 24, and up until the day before yesterday, a computer graphics artist for a small children's software company. She was engaged to the son of the owner, and when he wanted to start their sex life early, she told him no. He broke the engagement, had daddy fire her, and cancelled the lease on her company car and apartment. She took her clothes and came home. What exactly does a computer artist do? I am an author of several different types of books, and I need someone to do my book dust covers. I can also use a proofreader as my rewrites are driving me crazy. If you are interested, we can discuss salary, perks, and details with my lawyer Monday. I was a standard artist until I learned computer graphics in college. I draw, paint in oil and acrylic, and occasionally sculpt in clay, then cast in bronze. I only sculpt on commission, and they don't come by too often. I would be very interested in either or both positions, I am not hurting for money, but I need a job for my sanity. My degree is in fine arts with an English minor. Would you like to see some of my works? I would love to see some of your work. However, I know I am adjusting to the time zone change and am exhausted. Could I pick you up tomorrow and take you to lunch as a second date? I would like that, but if it is a date, why would we discuss business? If it is a business meeting let's have the date start tomorrow evening. I live with my mother at 743 Alcona Avenue, South Side. If you're tired, how about I leave, and I will see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock or earlier if you want, but not before 9 o'clock, because this fair maiden needs her beauty sleep. What could you possibly do to improve perfect beauty? Okay, if you are up for it, we can have an early meeting at 9 o'clock, and then make a day of it. Lunch, mall walking, dinner and a play that I have tickets for. Does that sound like a plan? Yes indeed, Sir Knight, that sounds like a very good plan. As I escorted her to the door, she turned, got on tiptoe and gave me a nice kiss. Then as she was leaving she tossed out, I might enjoy that thrashing with an open hand on the posterior, when we get to know each other better. Good night John, you have rescued this damsel in distress. Even if the job doesn't work out, I am happier than I have been since I was dumped by asshole Junior. She drove off with my phone. The next morning I was up early, so I threw some of my clothes from my trip into the washer. Then I went to get my phone. CC never gave it to me. As it was very early, and I am not a complete deck, I waited until 7.30 to call my cell. A sleepy CC answered, John Carmody's phone. Can I take a message? Yes you can, this is your favorite asshole. What are you doing with my phone? Now I am going to have to administer two thrashing sessions. Good morning CC, I know it is mean to call you this early, but I couldn't resist. Would you like to go to breakfast to start the day of our second date? I also wanted to rub it in that we both forgot that you came to my place to deliver that instrument of death that you have in your hand. More giggles. How about you come over at 8.30? I will make you breakfast. I'm actually a very good cook. My mother is out of town, so it is not a meet the parents moment dot. I will be there with bells on, clothes also, the cops in this town have a thing against public nudity. More giggles and then a dial tone. When I drove up to the split level home, I could see that the neighborhood was probably upper middle class. I pulled into the circular drive and parked near the front door, I grabbed the cinnamon buns that I purchased for a tasty gift. As I approached the door, CC opened the door and I almost dropped the buns. At the door stood a green faced, hair curler covered head, but toothed dirty robe clad woman. She gave me a glare and then couldn't hold it anymore. She started with a giggle, and by the time I reached the door, she was in all out laughter. This is what you get when you rob a woman of her beauty sleep, Sir Knight. Then she started laughing again. I grabbed her green slimed face, curlers and all, and planted a kiss on her. When I let her go, I said, name my sweet princess, the camouflage cannot hide thy fairness, beauty such as yours would shine through concrete. Then after staring at me for a moment, a second laughing session started. You goof, the kiss was wonderful, but now you have green all over your face and hands. Come on in before the neighbors see me and wonder who that crazy woman is that's in my house. Then we can both wash up. With that, she pulled off the curler wig and the phony teeth and showed me into the house and after taking my gift pointed me to the guest room bathroom. After washing up, I walked out to the kitchen and grabbed a seat. 
CC walked in, and the green was gone, and a smile that would light a dark tunnel was on her face. I wore that Jetta to Halloween party last year, knowing you have a sense of humor, I thought I would get you back for the 7.30 call. I was barely awake and thinking about last evening. Then she held out her hand with my phone. Let's not forget this, this time. Now, do you want to conduct business and call breakfast a business meeting, or have lunch somewhere and use that as the meeting? Business breakfast, then you must face the open-handed thrashing or buy me lunch, your choice. I laughed at the horror-stricken face so I went on. The thrashings will only be 20 lashes open-handed on the bare posterior, and you are only required to submit to two, so far, but the day is young. I don't know if you're serious or not, but I think lunch is a good idea. When she saw my poopy lip, she laughed. You were kidding weren't you? You'll never know now, you ruined my fun. I must say, with no crudeness meant, that you have a very spankable posterior. I don't want you to leave, but I enjoy it when you walk away. That earned me a huge smile and swat on the arm. I looked at her and got a brilliant idea, my ego thought it was brilliant anyway. What does your book library look like, you seem to be intelligent, and if you have any similar book to what I write with the dust cover intact, I can get an idea of whether we are looking at the same ideas. Okay, but I need to warn you, I hated most of the dust covers, so I did my own to fit the book. I tried to present the theme of the story from my reading of it. After breakfast, my stomach is empty wench, me man, me hungry. That earned me a second swat and a cheek kiss. After breakfast of a baked scramble with mozzarella and Italian sausage, coffee, and conversation, Cece brought out several books with her dust covers and the originals. I was not totally surprised when two of the books were my romances, they are very popular. When I saw her covers, I knew she had captured the story's essence without giving away the story. I put these two covers together before I knew you wrote them. I researched Elizabeth Jester last night and surprise, it was a registered pseudonym of one John Carmody. What a coincidence. Huh. The covers were better than what the publisher supplied. I told her so. Then I asked if she wanted an opportunity to do all of my covers from that point forward. Yes yes. Okay, I will give my agent and my publisher a call. You said you had an English minor, would you be interested in being my test reader, and also my proofreader? That would mean some extra income. It would also be fairly steady work as I complete a book about every month. Yes again, I would love it, and I would finally be using all of my skills. My agent and publisher were both on board, and my publisher even had CC do the paperback covers for all of my books, and those of some of the other authors. My agent loved having another client, and I got a first-rate proofreader. CC was surprised that I used three different pen names. I explained that that was my publisher's idea. She, my publisher, did not think women would buy romance novels written by a man. She also felt that the western-based romances needed different authorship. The third pen name was to protect my privacy. With her checking my spelling, syntax, and grammar, I was doing fewer rewrites, and writing more books. I went from 12 or 13 books a year to 15 or 16. After that first weekend, CC and I dated for several months. We were together almost every day and most evenings. CC commandeered one of the bedrooms opposite mine as an office. She said she needed to be away from all distractions when she was creating. After a year, I asked her if she wanted to move in. I thought it was unnecessary to drive to her mom's when she just slept there, then drove back and shared breakfast. She agreed but said, I'll move in, but you need to make closet space in the master, because I am not sleeping in any bed, but yours. I was floored. I shouldn't have been, we had occasionally had sex, but I did not realize that she had that kind of feeling for me. I mentioned earlier that authors are strange. Before you move in then, I have a couple of very important questions to ask you. Do you love me? I am very much in love with you. Then, if you love me will you marry me? There was no hesitation, yes I love you, and yes I will marry you. Well, we need to do two things soon. One, we need to tell your mother. And two, we need you to meet my parents and my sister. Mother already knows. I was going to ask you to marry me if you did not get off the pot. I would love to meet your family. We had the meet and greets. CC's mother, Laura, was a somewhat subdued, somewhat beaten down looking woman. I liked her but wanted to talk to CC about her. My parents and my sister Jane got along with CC like she was a second daughter. The three ladies went into a long distance planning festival. CC wanted to have a short engagement. I was all for that. I asked CC if she objected to a prenuptial agreement. She had a couple of reservations but was not against the idea. I made a suggestion that seemed to make CC very happy. I suggested that we each contribute a fixed amount to a joint account, and anything above that was ours to use as desired or not. Then I had another thought. 
I found out from CC that her mother was about to lose her house. I asked CC if she would have an objection to me offering her the housekeeper job. My current housekeeper wanted to leave, and I had two available bedrooms so she could live without worrying about living arrangements. I would buy her house and rent it out. That earned me an unbelievable kiss and an exhausting night. The wedding was great, and we honeymooned in Hawaii. We only spent a single day on the beach. The rest of the time was spent exploring the rainforest, Mauna Loa, and a trip to Molokai to study the history of the leper colony. After the visit, I thought I might get a book out of it. Instead, I got a fictional young adult series of seven books that covered the colony and some of the families that came and lived with the patients. That series was my best work in my opinion. CC decided that she would accept outside commissions for her art, she would still do my covers, and the covers of several other authors, but she thought I should get a different proofreader. She even had a candidate in mind. My sister Jane had graduated from college. She had done a stint in the military before starting, so she was a non-traditional student. She also did not have any student loans to pay off. Her major was secondary education, with a minor in English composition. She had one year of teaching 15 and 16 year old mommy's little darlings, and decided that she was not a professional babysitter. The system was glad to have her leave, as more than half of her students did not pass her course. Jane took over the last of the bedrooms and was a stern taskmaster on my writing, but my number of rewrites decreased some more to less than one per book. I was happy, CC was happy, and Jane was ecstatic. Laura was now a very pleased and proud den mother of three adult children. Jane and I were officially unofficial adoptees. Things went along great for the next two years when my agent told me that a movie company was interested in the Leper Colony series. I had to go to New York City for preliminary negotiations, and after a week away from CC and my happy menagerie, I was ready to shoot someone. These idiots from the movie company thought that enough money thrown at me would make me roll over and kiss their bums. That did not happen. The second Monday meeting was a revelation for the movie people. It was short and sweet. I said no and caught a plane home. My agent called me the following Wednesday and said, those assholes asked when they could set up the next meetings. They did not understand that if they did not change their position and their demands, there would be no additional meetings. He continued, I explained that you had total control of all rights to anything you wrote. They even offered me a bribe to lie to you to get the contract signed. That was when I escorted them out of my building. The building that your money built, if it wasn't for you as my base client, all of the other authors I handle would leave. Hollywood must have wised up. A month later, an entirely different team came to me and paid to have my agent come to town also. This time we settled everything in one day. That is except for the legal language. That would never be settled without a few hundred billable hours. The basics of the deal were that I had total script control and veto power over any sexually suggestive scenes. It was my intention that the entire series would have a PG rating. It was written for young adults after all. I was also paid a small armored car full of $100 bills for the movie rights. My tax bill that year was almost as much as the village government's budget where my house was located. The shooting schedule for the first movie was coming quickly, and the movie people wanted me on site for the first couple of months. Of course, they would not be filming on Molokai, they had to go to a couple of Central American countries, and make them look like they were islands. I was not happy, CC was not happy, and I stayed exactly one week and shut the project down. Hollywood was not happy, especially when I informed them that the director insisted that full nudity and simulated sex were on his agenda. He was fired, and they started again, but without me on site. They sent me the scripts and script changes. The new director was so afraid I would get him fired that he did not want me on set. That was fine with me. CC was doing gangbusters business, and her sculpting commissions had over a two-year wait. She had more work than she could do out of a converted bedroom, and I had more money than God, so I bought an old out-of-business art gallery, and leased it to her for $100 a month. That earned me a lot of love. Things were fine for a couple of months, and then CC started spending more and more time at the studio. The big fly in the ointment showed up about six months after she started to work in her new studio. It came in the form of a male model that was hired for, of all things, one of my romance book covers. Gerard Clausen was 6'3 tall, and a Fabio wannab. He was good looking and knew it. He also had enough ego for an entire Chippendale dance troupe. At the barbecue, I heard CC and Jane talking about Gerard. What I heard was CC planning to explore and Jane encouraging. They were both very drunk. Jane loudly said that man is such a hunk. If you can keep my naive idiot of a brother from finding out, I say duck the hunk and have a good time. CC was just as loud and said, I'm so tempted if I knew that John would never find out I would be naked and spread in a heartbeat. 
They were both on their way to being drunk, but that was no excuse. Drunkenness lowers inhibitions, not planting ideas. I left the party and went and shut myself in the bedroom office and locked the door. I noticed I had been crying. When I had set the office up, I had as the first piece of furniture installed a fold-out daybed. My reasoning was that if I was on a roll with a story, I did not want to leave the office. I love those two women as much as I like living. I cried for a while because, hey, I wrote romance novels. I decided that I would not sleep in the same bed as the traitor switch of a wife. Even thinking of cheating was cheating in my book. I decided to write two letters. The first would be to my ex-sister. Then I would follow that with one to my soon-to-be ex-wife. My dear loving sister. This letter is to inform you that your employment is terminated effective immediately. The reason is this drunken statement you loudly made to my wife at the party last night. That man is such a hunk. If you can keep my naive idiot of a brother from finding out, I say duck the hunk and have a good time. Because of that statement, you have shown me you no longer have your employer's best interest as your primary concern. I will not be disrespected, and when a sibling plots against another sibling, they are no longer related. You are hereby notified that you have 10 days to leave this rent-free house. You are to take only your personal possessions. You may not remove any item, written or electronically stored that pertains to my copyrights. That includes books, manuscripts, movie scripts, and written outlines. This is also to inform you that as you are a backstabbing witch, I no longer consider you my sister. I am sending a copy of this letter to my mother, and also including it in your personnel file and to my lawyer. Sincerely, your ex-brother, John Carmody. I printed three copies, signed them and placed one under Jane's bedroom door, and drove to a mailbox and dropped the others addressed to my mother and lawyer in it. I then drove around for a couple of hours. I got back to the house, and the ladies had apparently decided to look for me. My office door was open, and so was the bedroom door, and the ladies were both fully clothed sleeping on the bed. The letter to my wife was just as nasty. Carolina Catherine Dolman Carmody. You had quite a party last night. I specifically asked you and Jane not to serve any alcohol at the party. You did anyway. After overhearing two drunken women talking loudly, I left the party. In case you didn't notice, last night I did not sleep in the marriage bed. I will not be sleeping in that bed again. In case you don't remember the conversation, it was about Gerard, you Fabio wanted. You two were discussing how you wanted to have sex with him, and Jane was encouraging you. Your exact words were, I'm so tempted if I knew that John would never find out I would be naked and spread in a heartbeat. Well, this letter and the enclosed wedding ring are your permission to explore. As Jimmy Carter noted, lust in the heart is still cheating. All I ask is that you have the decency to move out before you explore and drop the Carmody from your name. First thing Monday, I am filing for divorce. You will have to move anyway, as the house is mine. You might want to talk to my ex-sister about living arrangements as she is unemployed and has lost her residence. I will also be strictly enforcing the prenuptial agreement. I will not be disrespected by you, my ex-sister, or that asshole of a model who knows you are married to me. I am going to go to New York Sunday morning, and on Monday I will have your contracts for my book covers to end with those books that have not gone to press yet. I do not know when you stopped respecting me, but it hurt me more than you can understand. Not only were you plotting to cheat on me, but you were also doing it loudly, in my house, in front of neighbors, in front of friends, and people important to my profession, and with my ex-sister. Maybe I am, as my ex-sister put it, naive and an idiot, but I am a person. One who stated in front of God and community to forsake all others do you perhaps not remember that you said the same thing in front of the same audience? I must try to get some sleep as I need to leave as soon as I can tomorrow. You will not communicate with me except through my attorney until the divorce is final. I really did, and probably still love you, but the hurt you caused last night will not let me let it go by. I do hope you can find a life that makes you happy. I was obviously not the one and not the one enough. You soon to be ex-husband, John Carmody. P.S. Enclosed is the wedding ring you placed on my finger, it may be a little bent and have some cracks, but it must have been a good quality one, because I could not break it. I don't need it anymore. I had taken a hammer to the ring and placed it and the letter in an envelope, then I placed the envelope on CC's toothbrush holder. I also printed a copy to take to my agent and one for my lawyer. My coffee is cold now. I have reservations for a flight and a cab in an hour. I have packed just enough for the rest of the weekend, I will buy what I need in New York. The ladies haven't stirred yet, so I think I will go out front and wait. I do not want to hear excuses or the lies that it was just talking. I don't know where this will go, but it will go on, and I will survive. CC's story. 
I woke up fully dressed on my bed next to my sister-in-law. I had a drum and bugle corps wearing steel soled boots marching through my head. I also thought they had walked through a pile of dog crap before they walked through my mouth to my brain. Jane and I had gotten drunk at a party last night and had a great time talking trash about the gorgeous model, Gerard Clausen, I am working with. Now the pain was reminding me of some of the cost of that fun. I say some of the cost because as I was reaching for my toothbrush, I saw the envelope. I opened the envelope and the smashed ring fell out. I saw what ring it was and vomited into the sink. I realized that the letter was from my husband, and when I read it, I was devastated. I had been drunk, stupid, and arrogant. Now I am well on my way to being alone. Then I look again at the destroyed wedding ring in an envelope placed where I would find it when I woke up. The destroyed wedding ring pointed to my life going forward as not being good news. When I stopped crying, I felt hands on my shoulders. Jane was asking what was wrong. I showed her the ring and the letter. She read the letter and when she got to the first ex-sister part, she gasped and started crying herself. What have we done? I didn't know John could hear us, it was just girl talk. Jane said, we would never have gone through with it. I said, John doesn't know that, and neither do all the people at the party. John was almost 20 feet away, so we must have been very loud. What am I going to do? Jane stopped crying and finished reading the letter. This letter says John is kicking me out and I'm fired. We need to find him and talk to him. We need to let him know that you would not do what we talked about. She hesitated, you wouldn't would you? I could not answer, but the guilt must have shown on my face. I had all of the thoughts that we had, apparently loudly, talked about last night. You would have, wouldn't you? I could only nod. I love John with all of my heart and soul, but that man is gorgeous. He makes my panties wet every time I see him. I really do not know if I could resist if he made a hard play for me. Right now it is just flirting. Then I remembered what John had written about no longer doing his covers. Oh, shit, I'm going to have to fire Gerard and all of my staff because John is going to cancel my book cover contract. Jane looked at me like I had a third eye. You're worried about that eye candy and your staff when your husband is going to divorce you. You are indeed an arrogant witch if that is your first thought. You really can't love John that much if money is your first thought. Damn it, you're right. I need to get to New York and be at the publisher's office when John gets there. Maybe I can get down on my hands and knees and crawl through broken glass to beg for a chance to make this right. Jane left the master suite and headed to her room. About 30 seconds later I heard her running back screaming. No no I got a letter too. Please don't let it be as bad as yours. Then she was back with the unopened letter. She opened the letter with shaking hands. Please read it for me, I am afraid of what he is saying in there. I read those hurtful words. I started crying all over again. I handed her the letter and went to finish getting cleaned up and dressed. When I came out of the bath, Jane was no longer in the room. The letter was on the floor. I picked it up and put it on my makeup desk with the bent ring in my letter. I grabbed the phone and called the hotel that I stayed at the last time I was in New York. I made open-ended reservations for Sunday night through at least Thursday. Then I called the airlines and bought a round-trip first-class ticket to New York on the first available flight. I went into the kitchen and saw John's favorite coffee cup on the deck table. I went and retrieved it. I emptied the half-empty cup and started crying again. My love had not even finished half a cup before it went cold. I heard noises coming from the guest side of the house, and so after I started the coffee and put a couple of microwavable breakfasts to cook, I went to see how Jane was doing. When I got to her bedroom door, I saw that she was packing. I went in and asked her to stop for a second. Jane, please don't pack yet. I'm going to New York today to see if John will talk to me. If you will, I'm going to beg as I said, and if you will listen, apologize profusely and abjectly, and try to save my marriage. Besides, John's letter said 10 days, and you will need at least a couple of days to find a place if you need it. She stopped, looked at me and started crying again. I love my brother, and I don't know how I am ever going to make it up to him for my stupidity. I am sorry I said what I said. I don't even remember saying it. I just remember us giggling like six-year-olds as we went into your bedroom. What can I do to help you get him back? As I was packing, I spotted the letters and the damaged ring. I went into my jewelry box and got a 16 plain gold neck chain. I threaded the ring on it and put it around my neck. On the plane, I went over all of the things that led up to the drunken debacle. Work was very stressful, with the sexual undertones that I was feeling towards Gerard Clausen, a model I hired for one of my book cover projects. Gerard is an absolute hunk with long black hair, 6 feet tall, probably 225 pounds. He has never actually crossed any lines to actually flirting, but I wasn't kidding when I told Jane that my panties get wet every time I work with him. 
I really don't know if he made a pass at me if I wouldn't fall on my back and spread my legs. Don't misunderstand, I love John, and if it were anyone else, there would not even be a temptation. John is a wonderful, caring, loving man and a great husband. It's just that our sex life has become routine. There is no spark, and I don't understand where that spark went, or what caused it to be destroyed. As I was wolgathering about what happened, I realized that John had done nothing to kill the spark. When I moved my work out of the house, I started to use work as an excuse to stay away from John. I did not have to spend 10 to 12 hours at the studio. My book cover work can be done at home. My sculpting can be done when the inspiration hits. I also realized that since I moved my work out of the house, I have not been responding to John as a loving wife. I have not initiated sex, and sometimes I have just allowed him to duck me, with no response from me. Even if I can't convince John to come back, I will pay Jared off, and find someone else for the cover. Hell, I usually do a cover in 4 or 5 days, this cover with Jared is over 3 weeks along, and I am not even sure it is good quality work. John has a right to be angry. I was no closer to deciding what to do as the plane was descending down to land. Monday morning, I was in the publisher's office. I did not sleep well last night. The hotel desk clerk tried to play some games, and I had to call the hotel manager and tell him what was going on. I finally got an upgrade, and the desk clerk was dressed down in front of me and the rest of the desk staff. I got into the office as soon as it opened. I told the receptionist that I was waiting for my husband who said he was going to be here today. About 2.30, I began to worry that John was not going to show up today. I called Jane and asked if John had called her. She said no, and when she tried to call him, his phone rang in the office bathroom counter. We talked for a couple of minutes, and I ended the call. The offices closed at 5 o'clock. John never showed up. I went back to the hotel and spent another restless evening. I kept my cell phone on, even on the charger. Back at the hotel, I sat down and wrote out the steps I am going to do to fix this. 1. Stop all current work, and terminate Gerard and his entourage. 2. Move all of my work out of the gallery. A. Find a new venue. B. Move to that venue. 3. Find a place to live if John insists I move out. 4. Work on John to fix this. Number 4 should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I looked at the list and crumbled it up and tossed it in the trash. I didn't need a list or plan, I needed John. I finally decided that the first thing I needed to do was apologize to all of the people who were at the party. At the same time, I was going to terminate my book cover work. I decided that it couldn't wait until I returned home. I decided to use email for now. I had a mass email address group of all of the people that had been invited to the barbec. I also had an email address for Gerard. I decided to email Gerard first. To gerard.klausenitzksmail.com Gerard, I regret to inform you that, because I have had my contract for Elizabeth Jester's book covers terminated, I must end your employment. I will, of course, pay all monies due to you. I will also pay any housing costs through Saturday at 5 p.m. If in the future I have a need for someone that you would meet the requirements, I will contact your agent. Sincerely, Carolina Catherine Dolman Carmody. CC John. Carmody is smell. Net. Elizabeth. Then I sent a separate email to the group that had gotten the invitations. Dear friends. This letter is to try to apologize to you for the stupidity that I showed at the barbecue last Saturday evening. If you did not make the party, this is an apology for the hurt I caused my husband and his relationship with you. What I did and said caused immense hurt to my husband. I have no excuse, being drunk is not an excuse or cause. What I said and even getting drunk were insults to my dear husband. He has decided to take some actions to stop the insult and hurt. Should John and I somehow separate, I wish you all will support John. He did not deserve it, and he should not lose your friendship because of what I did. Again, I apologize for any embarrassment that I caused. Sincerely, Carolina Catherine Dolman Carmody, cc, john.carmodyitzksmail.net. I pushed, send and cried again. After the emails were sent, I called my mother. She answered on the first ring. Where in the hell are you? You have several people trying to get hold of you. Your sister-in-law packed up and left, your mother-in-law is furious at you and wants a big piece of your backside to chew on. Just what in the hell did you do to piss so many people off? Mom, I got drunk at a party last Saturday and I said some things that hurt John to the point that he is going to file for a divorce. He has told me that he will not use me on any more of his book covers. He wants me out of the house. Was it that bustard of a model that you hired? 
Did that eye candy with the ego bigger than the earth and the intelligence of rocks get to you? Were you that stupid that you did not know that he is queerer than a $9 bill? She took a deep breath. I thought John asked you not to have booze at the barbecue. He did, didn't he? Yes to all of your questions except that I did not know Gerard is gay. I continued. If John should call, please have him call me. I need to do some major, sincere groveling to try and save my marriage. I'm to the point now that I don't care about the covers of the sculpture commissions. I just want John, the only man I have ever loved back. Well if he calls, I will give him the message, but you had better be ready to kiss his ass for the next 100 years, if what you said caused as much damage as you say it did. Then she ended the call. Great, now I have pissed my mother off. Just then, my email notification ring went crazy. I received return emails from almost all of the guests, none of them were neutral, and only one was positive. Most of them gave me hell for hurting a good man, and telling me he left the party in tears. Some of them asked me to refrain from contacting them, as they wanted nothing to do with the selfish, hurtful witch. The one positive was from an asshole man who asked to get together and rock my world. He didn't mention his wife or kids. All in all, it was about what I expected, except there was no response from John. I closed my laptop and went into the bathroom to shower and get ready for bed. Once in bed, I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned, cried and sulked until about 4 am when I must have dozed. I was up at 7 and dressed and ready to return to John's publisher's office. At 8 o'clock I hailed a cab. At 9 o'clock on the nose, I was in the same chair. This time, I brought my laptop. When I turned the laptop on, the email ring came on too. It was Gerard. CC. I talked to your husband about my contract. He told me why you are losing your contract. As you are losing it through no fault of mine, I will sue for complete payment unless you agree to pay the entire fee. Gerard. Well if that did not suck eggs. There was still no word from John. About 11.30 I started to get worried. I finally asked to see John's publisher. I was shown into her office. Adrian Amara had been John's publisher since he wrote his first book. She was an is a no-nonsense lady. She looked up from her desk and asked, What can I do for you, Miss Stolman? Her words cut me to the quick. I'm Mrs. Carmody, and you know it. I would like to know my status with this company and my author contracts, you witch. You forget yourself, Miss Stolman. If you were at home today, you would have received a FedEx overnight envelope containing a check for your remaining contract obligations. We do not need nor do we want any more covers from you for John's work. As to your individual author contracts, we have informed all of our authors that they will be required to honor or buy out those contracts. Now unless we have any more business, you may leave. One last thing, I was standing right next to John when you opened your stupid mouth and destroyed a very good man. I will do no more business with you ever. I got up and left. I was defeated. John must have completed his business over the phone. I left for the hotel to pack. As I was packing, my email rang again. This time it was John. CC. I accept your apology. That does not change the fact that you publicly disrespected me and even went so far as to say very loudly that if I would not find out, you would cheat on me. As I said I accept your apology, but just being sorry is not enough. I was at Gary Chambers office today. As you know, as you use him too, he is an entertainment lawyer. He gave me the name of a divorce lawyer that I am seeing tomorrow. As I said in the letter, you will need to move out of the house. It was mine before we were married, and our prenuptial says that you will only get half of the joint account. Hell, if you don't fight the divorce, you can have it all, and I will add $100,000 in the gallery. I will even pay to have the gallery modified to include an apartment on the second floor if you want. I just want your disrespect out of my face. John Carmody. CC. Sally.Winston.Addy at xxxxxxxx.com. I read that and knew it was over. It is just so harsh that I am losing a man I love because I wanted another in my mind. John's story. After I got in the cab to go to the airport for the flight back to my house, I thought about what had happened to put me here. Cece and my ex-sister both heaped what I felt was a public humiliation on me. My thoughts went back over the past few months. Cece was pleased when I bought her an out-of-business gallery and had it reconfigured into a studio for her to create in. I was practically killed with love for a couple of months, and then things slowly changed. CC spent more time at her gallery than at home. Our lovemaking disappeared and it became a mercy duck occasionally. Then about three weeks ago she hired a male model for one of my book covers. He was a Fabio 1 of 63 and chiseled. He also had an ego bigger than the Donald. Once she started using him, I was ignored. 
On top of that, where she usually spent three to five days to complete a book cover, Gerard Clausen had been in town for almost three weeks. I asked about the cover, and every time I got still working on it. Then this past weekend I was hosting a Saturday night barbecue for friends, family, and professional associates, including my publisher and my literary agent. I was asked by my loving wife if Gerard was invited. I said, no, not only no, but hell no. Then I politely asked my loving wife and my supportive sister to not have any alcohol at the party. They ignored me and proceeded to get wasted and loud. Then came the exchange that devastated me. I woke up early and got some coffee and went out on the deck to think. I needed to call the airline and the hotel chain I use when I have to go to New York. I booked a round trip first class with an open-ended return and booked a suite with the same provisions. I thought that I would be in the city at least until Wednesday and possibly until the weekend. On the flight, I realized that my publisher and agent had been at the house last night and I was flying to meet them in the city. They either would not be there or probably would not be in their offices until Tuesday. When the plane landed and I was in the terminal I called my agent and told him that I would not insist that he drop CC as a client, that it was his decision. Then I told him, she will no longer do any future covers for me. But the rest of her work is up to her and you. Then I called my publisher, Adrian Imar. I told her that any cover that CC had submitted for books gone to press were to be used, but if the book has not gone to press, I needed a new artist. I told Adrian that if she had to pay CC for her complete contract, to bill me for it. When I accomplished that, I had no real desire to stay in New York. I called the hotel and cancelled my reservations. Then I went to the airline ticket counter and switched my return to a trip from New York to Portland or to end back at my home. On the flight to Oregon, I contemplated what I would do for the rest of my life. The two women closest to me betrayed me, at least to my way of thinking about it. I would, of course, continue writing. A writer only stops writing when he dies, even if he never puts it on paper. Anything else was not on my radar at the time. The plane landed, and I went to my room in the airport hotel. It was near dinner time on the coast, so I ordered a steak and a course. I woke up the next morning and decided to just drive around Portland. I hadn't been there for many years. I went along the Columbia Gorge Highway, saw a bunch of windsurfers having a good time, watched a good-sized ship pass through one of the locks, and in general was a tourist. That night I had dinner at the Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood. The food was excellent, and the ambience took my mind off my troubles for a brief period. Tuesday morning, I got a call from Gerard Clausen, the Fabio wanted. He wanted to know what happened to have his contract terminated. When I explained that I did not have anything to do with his contract, but that CC was probably trying to cover her ask, he should talk to her. Later that day, I received two emails from CC. I read them. One was a copy of the email to Gerard. That explained the call from Gerard. The next was an apology to all of our invitees to the Barbeck. The apology sounded sincere, but I was still hurt. I called my business lawyer, Gary Chambers, and asked him to recommend a divorce attorney. The name he gave me was Sally Winston, and I called her office and had a consult on the phone. I mentioned the prenup, and that I was willing to do better if she did not fight it. Sally recommended a few things and said that when I got back in town, we would meet and sign the papers and pay her. She also said I should respond to her apology. I told her my thoughts and she was in agreement with them. So I sent a response to her apology email to CC. That was the end of my correspondence with CC for that day. I was closing my laptop when a new email popped up. It was from my sister. John. I know you are extremely angry at me. I really don't blame you. I will be out of your house by next Monday. I am very sorry I hurt and embarrassed you at the party on Saturday. What I said was just stupid talk. CC and I talked Sunday morning and realized that the makeup ass kissing was going to have to be going on for many years. I love you John, you have been my support since I got out of high school. You supported me when I went into the military and helped pay for my college. I really enjoy working for you. I would like to in the future if we ever can reconcile. For now, I will do as you ask. I hope that someday you will forgive me. I never meant to hurt or disrespect you as a brother or boss. But I did. I am so sorry. Please accept this apology as it is meant. I will let you initiate contact if you decide you want to. I will not close any doors, but you must push them open. Please know that I love you. Your sister always, Jane Carmody. I read it over and over and realized that Jane is family, and while I was still angry at her for the insult, I had probably hurt her almost as bad when we were growing up. I responded. Jane, I accept your apology, and I forgive you. You are my sister whether I am mad at you or not. Believe me, I am mad at you. 
Now that that is out of the way, I still want you out of the house. I also meant what I said about you being terminated as my proofreader. I think we were probably too close together for too much time each day. I love you, but after what you said, I don't like you too much right now. I suspect that at some time I will get over it. Let me have that time and for now the space to heal. I am seeing a lawyer tomorrow to start the divorce proceedings. I have already told CC that I will not take her back. You need to understand that the problems at the party were just the latest problems. Your words just added to them. By the way, did either of you women know Gerard is gay, and would not have seduced CC if she really wanted it to happen? Your own ex-brother, John. Things were calm when I got back to the house on Wednesday of that week. I arrived home, and the house was vacant. CC's mother had put a letter of resignation on the kitchen counter. CC had cleaned out all of her stuff, and Jane had done the same. For the next few days, I did all of the things I hired a housekeeper for. When Monday rolled around, I called Mary Maids and asked if they placed live in housekeepers. They did not but recommended that I might call the college and get two or three part-time college girls. They also said that there was almost always someone on campus in need of work and living arrangements. I decided to take that thought and run with it. I got the number for and talked to the creative writing professor. He had four young ladies that needed to move out of their apartment, as the landlord was trying to make them give him sexual favors. I told him my predicament and said that perhaps I could interview them, and if we could work something out, they could share two to a bedroom and use the third as a study area. I added that I would, if asked, help them with their writing assignments as I had a few books published. The professor laughed and said, we have a class dedicated to Elizabeth Jester books. That turned out to be both a great and a terrible idea. The girls were very proper and nice young ladies. Two of them, Sarah Cunningham and Angela Mason, were sophomores, and the other two, Alina Rodriguez and Sandy Skidmore, were juniors. They all were interested in part-time work and the offer of living quarters. They were excited to get paid and have living space and quiet study space. Their only complaint was the drive, but I pointed out that they were no longer paying rent and had a job. I would lease them each a small car to go to and from campus. They could only use the cars going to campus during school hours or to the campus library after hours, unless they all went in a group. If they went as a group, I would let them use my SUV. Any other trips in the cars were to be cleared by me. No drinking while driving my vehicles. As we talked about what I needed and what they needed we decided to come up with some rules. We mutually came up with a set of 11. We wrote them down and posted them on the kitchen entrance door. Rules of the house. All persons in the common areas will be properly attired. No just bras and panties for the girls. No just undershorts for the boss. No nude or semi-nude sunbathing. Bikinis are okay, but tops and bottoms are to remain tied. Live with the tan lines or go to a tanning salon. No underage drinking, and absolutely no drags of any kind. No overnight guests in the girls' area. Any guests of the girls must stay in the common areas, no exceptions. If guests are here to study and study they will. In the common areas. The boss will allow these groups to use the dining area. The boss's office is off limits when the door is closed. No cleaning, no knocking, except in emergencies, off limits. The girls' area is off limits except for inspections, or when invited. The boss's side of the house is off limits after lights out. Any dietary requests are to be written down, and will be addressed in the Saturday morning supply room. All parties and residents are invited to participate in the supply room. Boss buys lunch. The gardener and lawn boy are paid to work outside. They are not to be invited into the house, except to use the bathroom. They know these rules, don't tempt them to break them. Lights out in the common area is midnight every night, except when the boss is entertaining. Violations of these rules will cause the offending party to lose any common area privileges for one month. Any drugs or underage drinking mean eviction. When the boss is entertaining the girls may join in or not as they wish. Proper decorum and attire will be enforced. The girls wing will be off limits to all party goers. They were happy with the rules. CC decided to fight the divorce. She also refused to leave the gallery when I served her an eviction notice. Even at $100 a month she was 3 months behind. I told the utility companies that as I was no longer supporting the building, the utilities were to be shut off and a final bill sent to my accountant. Then I put a realtor sign on the building. CC was not happy. She came over to the house one afternoon when the girls were on the deck sunbathing. I had not changed the locks. She walked in just as Sarah was getting iced tea for all of them. CC screamed to Sarah, who in the duck are you and what are you doing dressed like that in my house? I heard the noise and came out of the office. CC. Shut up. 
This is not now nor has it ever been your house. These girls live here during this school year. Now if you want a civil discussion, get your bum in the chair and leave my housekeepers alone. She was visibly shaken by my rant. She slid into one of the dining area chairs. I went outside and apologized to the girls. Sarah was crying. I took her hand and led her back to CC. You have 15 seconds to apologize to this young lady. She is here with my permission. You have again let your mouth overrule your brain. After you apologize, get your bum out of that chair and out of my building downtown. Your 15 seconds starts now. CC looked like I had slapped her. She dropped her house and gallery keys on the table and left. That day I called my lawyer and told her to take all but the prenup off the table and to demand that CC sign within 15 days or we go to court. She had to sign papers within a week. I took the girls down to the gallery to look the place over. There was nothing wrong or dirty with the place. There was, of course, some dust, but apparently no one had been in the place for days. I talked to the girls and told them that I really did not need this place. I then asked their opinion of the idea of converting it to apartments for off-campus housing. I explained that I would have at least one resident manager, probably a married couple. With the rest of the space I could create six two-bedroom apartments. We decided to work with the college and the city council. The college was all for it. I went with my designs and got city council approval. The build-out was finished by the start of the next school year, and I found a local young married couple to be my live-in managers. The husband was unemployed and a very good handyman, so I made him the maintenance man. The kids loved the apartments, they were nice, cheap, and had dedicated study areas. The divorce became final, and CC never took her half of the joint account. It took almost a year, but Jane and I reconciled. When the first two girls graduated, she came back to live with me. She has started to write also and had two novels finished and published. She and I shared the office and assisted any of the girls still in the house. I became her proofreader, and she resumed being mine. She also stopped all alcohol use. I got a squeal, a hug and three thank yous in a row. Now I know where my life is going. I am helping a lot of kids, my sister is happy, and I am getting by. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this story. If it got your attention, drop a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more. Stay tuned for the next story. Thanks for hanging out, and take care.